Oklahoma where the wind goes sweeping down the plain. Greetings one and all and welcome back to Tom's Hit Parade. First of all, I want to thank you guys for your patience in letting me indulge myself taking the last couple of weekends off. Uh, I hadn't intended to take the last two weekends off, but well, I guess it was a case of me feeling burnt out, but not really aware that I was feeling burnt out. Of course, I've never been the quickest on the uptake, but uh, I guess I've mentioned to you once or twice that in the last month or so, my inspiration and motivation had kind of gone downhill, so that should have been my first clue, shouldn't it? But anyway, uh, be that as it may, uh, it felt really, really good to uh, for the last two weekends just to sit back and do nothing. I, I mean, I, I did a little spring cleaning around the room and around the house and stuff, but, you know, nothing constructive, at least in YouTube, but... Uh, I think I am getting my, my YouTube mojo back, so to speak. Uh, so hopefully you'll see uh, some now and thens in the next two or three weeks. Don't hold me to that, but I've got a good feeling. But anyway, uh, as for this today's video, I figured it was now or never that I did the August backtracks. Yes, try as I might, uh, I just can't seem to get backtracks to you in the first half of the month. That is an ongoing um, effort that I am trying, really am trying to uh, improve upon, but hey, better backtracks at the end of the month than no backtracks at all, right? But yes, backtracks is my monthly roundup of notable album anniversaries divisible by five with at least one spotlight album review. So let's just get into it before the month of August is actually over and talk about the albums that are celebrating anniversaries for the month of August 2020. 65 years ago this month, Dean Martin released Swingin' Down Yonder, his first album on the 12-inch LP format. It spent 10 weeks on the Billboard Albums chart, peaking at number seven. Produced by Lee Gillette and Voyle Gilmore, Martin was accompanied by Dick Stabile and his band for this album of standards with ties to the American South, including Georgia On My Mind, Basin Street Blues, Carolina in the Morning, and Dinah, which a young singer named Fanny Rose Shore sang back in the 30s, and thanks to a radio DJ who couldn't remember her first name, the song title became her stage name for the rest of her career, Dinah Shore. Also released in August of 1955 was the soundtrack from the film adaptation of the Rodgers and Hammerstein stage musical, Oklahoma. It topped the Billboard Albums chart for two weeks in its original mono release. In 1958, it was released in a stereo version, and in that same year was the first album to be awarded the RIAA's newly adopted gold certification for album sales of 500,000 or more. Featuring a cast led by Shirley Jones and Gordon McRae, the album includes the songs Oh What a Beautiful Morning, People Will Say We're In Love, the Surrey with the Fringe on top, and of course the title track, which two years earlier was adopted as the official state song of Oklahoma, replacing its original song, Oklahoma A Toast, written by Harriet Parker Camden. Happy 60th anniversary this month to Brenda Lee's self-titled sophomore album. It reached number five during its year-long run on the Billboard Albums chart. Produced by Owen Bradley, this album saw Brenda Lee backed by Floyd Kramer on piano, Boots Randolph on saxophone, Hank Garland on guitar, and Buddy Harmon on drums. The single, I'm Sorry, was Brenda's first number one hit on the Billboard Singles Chart. It reached number 12 in the UK, as did the album's first single, Let's Jump the Broomstick. Subsequent single, Sweet Nothings, reached number four on both the US and UK Singles Chart. That's All You Gotta Do also reached the US Top 10. August of 1960 also saw the release of Hits of the 50s, the sixth album by Sam Cooke. Produced by Hugo and Luigi, the album, as its title suggests, includes cover versions arranged and conducted by Glenn Osser of standards, show tunes, and pop songs that enjoyed chart success in the previous decade. Included are Cook's versions of Mona Lisa, a hit for Nat King Cole, Secret Love, popularized by Doris Day, Venus, made famous by Frankie Avalon, The Great Pretender, recorded by The Platters, and Cry, which was the most popular single released by Johnny Ray. In August of 1965, Paul Simon released his solo debut album, The Paul Simon Songbook. Released only in the UK, after the initial US failure of Simon and Garfunkel's debut album, Wednesday Morning 3AM, this album is mostly made up of solo acoustic renditions of songs he would later re-record with Garfunkel on their second and third albums. 
The Sound of Silence, and He Was My Brother were previously recorded by the duo on their debut. Neither the album nor its single, I Am A Rock, charted on their initial releases. Wednesday Morning 3AM didn't get released in the UK until three years after this album, and this album wouldn't see a US release until 1981. Also released 55 years ago this month was Sonny and Cher's debut album, Look At Us. After the duo's debut single, I Got You Babe, hit number one on the pop charts in the US, Canada, and the UK, they quickly recorded 11 other songs for this debut album, which reached number two on the Billboard 200 and was certified gold. It peaked at number three in Australia and number seven in the UK. I Got You Babe, Sonny and Cher's signature song, was also a top 10 hit in Ireland, Germany, Sweden, and the Netherlands. Follow-up single, Just You, went top 10 in Canada and top 20 in the US. Sing C'est La Vie topped the Belgian singles charts, and The Letter was a top 40 single in Canada. Half a century ago this month, Shirley Bassey released something. That's the title of her 14th album, Something. Her first album in eight years to reach the top 20 of the UK albums chart, it peaked at number five and spent 28 weeks in the top 50. It only peaked at number 105 on the Billboard 200, but it reached number 29 on the Billboard R&B albums chart. It consists of covers of standards and recent pop hits, including the title track, a cover of the Beatles song, which peaked at number four on the UK singles chart and number six on the Billboard Adult Contemporary chart, and was her most successful single since the title song for the James Bond movie Goldfinger in 1964. The album also includes renditions of the Frank Sinatra classic My Way, the show tune What Are You Doing the Rest of Your Life, and the Three Dog Night single Spinning Wheel. Also released in August of 1970 was the band's third album, Stage Fright. It was their highest charting album in the US, reaching number five, and like their previous two albums, it went gold. It also hit the number five position in the Netherlands and was a top 10 album in Canada and Norway. Lead off single, Time to Kill, was the only single from the album to crack the Billboard Hot 100, although it was a top 20 single in the Netherlands and charted in the top 50 in Canada. Subsequent single, The Shape I'm In, as well as the title track, would go on to become mainstays of the band's live shows. The album was the first to be produced by the band themselves, and was one of the first gigs for young recording engineer and future producer Todd Rundgren. August of 1975 saw the release of Pick Up the Litter, the sixth album by The Spinners. Although it fell just short of topping the Billboard R&B albums chart, as their previous three albums did, it was their highest charting album on the Billboard 200, peaking at number 8, and their fourth consecutive album to achieve gold certification. First single, Games People Play, was one of their most successful, topping the Billboard R&B singles chart, hitting number 2 on the Billboard Adult Contemporary chart, and reaching number 5 on the Billboard Hot 100. That track, as well as their follow-up single, Love or Leave, were both top 40 hits in Canada. The album Closer, Just As Long As We Have Love, includes an uncredited guest vocal from Dionne Warwick. Also released 45 years ago this month was Bruce Springsteen's third album, Born to Run. It currently holds six times platinum certification in the U.S. and spent five of its first six weeks on the Billboard 200 in the top ten, peaking at number three for two weeks. It reached number seven on the Australian, Dutch, and Swedish album charts. The title track, which reportedly took six months to record out of the full album's 14-month recording time, climbed to number 23 on the Billboard Hot 100, was a top 20 hit in Sweden, and a top 40 single in Australia. Follow-up single, 10th Avenue Freeze Out, also charted in the US and Canada, and album track, Thunder Road, became a radio and concert staple. The album re-entered the Billboard 200 in 1980 and 1985, following the success of his albums The River and Born in the USA, respectively. And it was in 1985 that the album reached its highest peak on the UK Albums Chart at number 17. Four decades ago this month, Pat Benatar released her sophomore album Crimes of Passion. It spent five weeks at its peak position of number two on the Billboard 200, kept from the top spot by John Lennon and Yoko Ono's Double Fantasy. It also reached number two on the Canadian and French album charts. It's currently certified quadruple platinum in the US and five times platinum in Canada. Four singles were released from the album. Hit Me With Your Best Shot peaked at number nine on the Billboard Hot 100 and at number 10 on the Canadian singles chart and reached the top 40 in Australia. Treat Me Right went top 20 in the US and Canada. And although it didn't chart, the album's first single, a cover of the Rascal song You Better Run, has the dis distinction of being the second music video ever to be shown on MTV when it launched on August 1st, 1981. 
Also released in August of 1980 was the George Benson album Give Me the Night. The only one of Benson's albums to be produced by Quincy Jones, it peaked at number three on the Billboard 200 and topped both the Billboard Jazz and Soul albums charts, and has been certified platinum by the RIAA. The title track was the biggest hit of Benson's career, reaching number one on the Billboard R&B singles chart and number four on the Billboard Hot 100, and was a top ten single in eight other countries, including France, South Africa, the UK, and Norway. Follow-up single, Love Times Love, was a top ten hit on the US R&B chart and in the UK. The album won Benson four Grammy Awards, including Male R&B Vocal Performance, Male Jazz Vocal Performance, R&B Instrumental Performance, and Best Instrumental Arrangement. The album includes instrumental assists from Lee Rittenauer and Herbie Hancock, and vocal contributions from Patty Austin and Michael McDonald. In August of 1985, John Mellencamp released his eighth album, Scarecrow. It peaked at number two on the Billboard 200 and on the Canadian and Australian album charts. It currently holds five times platinum certification in the U.S. The album produced three top ten Billboard Hot 100 singles, the most for any Mellencamp album. Lonely Old Night and Small Town both reached number six, while coming in at number one and number two respectively on the Billboard Rock Tracks chart. ROCK in the USA was the album's highest peaking single on the Hot 100 at number two, and charted at number six on the Rock Tracks chart. Subsequent singles, Rain on the Scarecrow and Rumble Seat, charted in the top 40. Ry Cooter plays slide guitar on the album track The Kind of Fella I Am, and Grandma's theme includes vocals by Mellencamp's grandmother, Laura. Also celebrating its 35th anniversary this month is Primitive Love, the second English language album and ninth album overall by the Gloria Estefan-led group Miami Sound Machine. It topped the Billboard Latin Pop Albums chart and was their first release to chart on the Billboard 200, peaking at number 21. It reached number 13 on the New Zealand Albums chart and by the end of the decade had sold over 6 million copies worldwide. Three of the album's four singles were top 10 hits on the Billboard Hot 100. Conga reached number 10, Bad Boy climbed to number 8, and Words Get In The Way peaked at number 5. The fourth single, Falling In Love, Uh Oh, peaked well inside the top 40 at number 25. The album currently holds triple platinum status in the US and platinum certifications in Canada and Australia. 30 years ago this month, Extreme released their sophomore album, Pornography. Their best-selling album, it peaked at number 10 on the Billboard 200 and received double platinum certification. Although the vast majority of the album consisted of electric guitar-based hard rock, its two biggest singles were quite the opposite. More Than Words, an acoustic ballad, was a number one hit in the US, Canada, the Netherlands, Belgium, and New Zealand, and went top ten in ten other countries. And Wholehearted, an acoustic folk-based song, climbed to number four on the Billboard Hot 100 and number three on the Canadian singles chart. Decadence Dance and Get the Funk Out also appeared on the mainstream rock tracks chart and the UK singles chart. The music video for More Than Words was spoofed by Weird Al Yankovic for his original ballad, You Don't Love Me Anymore. August of 1990 also saw the release of No Fences, the sophomore album by Garth Brooks. Not only did it top the Billboard Country Albums charts, but it spent nearly two and a half years in the top 40 of the Billboard 200, peaking at number three. It was Brooks's best-selling album and is currently certified 18 times platinum in the U.S. All four singles from the album were number one hits on the country singles charts in both the U.S. and Canada. Friends in Low Places, which won both the ACM and CMA awards for Single of the Year, Unanswered Prayers, Two of a Kind Working on the Full House, and The Thunder Rolls, whose theme of spousal abuse caused its video to be banned from CMT and TNN. The controversy prompted VH1 to begin airing the video and sparked a rise in donations to battered women's shelters. 25 years ago this month, Brian McKnight released his sophomore album, I Remember You. It peaked at number 22 on the Billboard 200 and number 4 on the Billboard R&B Albums chart and was certified gold by the RIAA. McKnight, who had previously written songs for the likes of Vanessa Williams and Boys to Men, wrote or co-wrote all tracks on this album except for the lead-off single Crazy Love, a cover of the Van Morrison hit, which reached the top 10 of the Billboard R&B singles chart and the top 50 of the Billboard Hot 100. Follow-up single, On the Down Low, was a top 20 hit on the Billboard R&B singles chart, and Still in Love landed in the top 40 of the same chart. Also released a quarter of a century ago this month was the soundtrack from the movie based on the classic video game Mortal Kombat. It was unique for its time in that it was made up mostly of EDM and industrial rock tracks by various artists, including KMFDM, Orbital, and Utah Saints. The album fought its way up to number 10 on the Billboard 200, and in less than six months became the first EDM album ever to achieve platinum certification. The film's principal composer, George S. Clinton, not to be confused with funkadelic frontman George Clinton, 
won a BMI Film Music Award for his work on the movie. The 2011 Guinness Book of World Records declared it the most successful video game spin-off soundtrack album. Happy 20th anniversary this month to Morchiba's third album, Fragments of Freedom. While it only peaked at number 113 on the Billboard 200, it was a top 10 album in the UK and Switzerland and reached the top 20 in France and Australia. It achieved gold certification in all four of those countries. The first single, Rome Wasn't Built in a Day, hit number two on the New Zealand singles chart and went top 40 in Switzerland and the UK. Follow-up single, Be Yourself, just missed the New Zealand top 40, but World Looking In was a top 40 single in Ireland. The album features contributions from American hip-hop artists Bahamadia, Mr. Complex, and Biz Markey. Also released in August of 2000 was Sing While You're Winning, the third album by Robbie Williams. It reached the top of the album's charts in the UK, Ireland, New Zealand, and Germany, and was a top 10 album in 12 other countries, including number 2 in Switzerland, number 3 in the Netherlands, number 4 in Austria, and number 5 in Italy. It holds multi-platinum certifications in Ireland, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. Lead-off single, Rock DJ, whose video got censored through most of Europe due to its graphic imagery, hit number one in both the UK and New Zealand, and was a top ten hit in Austria, Germany, and Switzerland. Second single, Kids, featuring Kylie Minogue, peaked at number two in the UK and was a top ten single in New Zealand and Ireland. Supreme reached the top five in the UK, Austria, Switzerland, and New Zealand, and Let Love Be Your Energy made the top ten in the UK. August of 2005 saw the release of Killer Queen, a tribute to Queen. It peaked at number 104 on the Billboard 200 during its month of release, and eight months later it re-entered the chart at number 115 after Queen Week during American Idol's fifth season. Now, I've never been a big tribute albums person myself, but this is a big exception in my book. This is just great. Uh, it has a surprising number of artists I really enjoy. That's what really made me buy this album. Uh, Gavin DeGraw performs We Are the Champions. And then uh, one of my favorite little-known rock bands, Eleven, actually appears on this album uh, with uh, with Josh Homme on vocals. They do Stone Cold Crazy. Uh, Jason Mraz, a bit of an odd choice maybe, but he sings uh, Good Old Fashioned Lover Boy. And uh, Joss Stone is on here. She does Under Pressure. Uh, Los, Los Lobos sings Sleeping on the Sidewalk. Rooney, another one of my favorite lesser-known rock bands. They do Death on Two Legs. And then we have, you know, The Flaming Lips, John Bryan, Sum 41, Josh Kelly, Breaking Benjamin. I mean, this is just, this is an all-star tribute. I mean, well, it was in 2005 anyway. But yeah, fantastic album. You gotta pick it up if you haven't yet. Especially if you like Queen. Also released 15 years ago this month was Brad Paisley's fourth album, Time Well Wasted. It was his second consecutive album to top the Billboard Country Albums chart, and it reached number two, his highest ranking to that point, on the Billboard 200. It eventually went double platinum. First single, Alcohol, peaked at number four on the Billboard Country Singles chart, but all three of the album's subsequent singles, When I Get Where I'm Going, a duet with Dolly Parton, The World, and She's Everything, were number one country hits. All singles except The World went top 40 on the Billboard Hot 100. The album track, Out in the Parking Lot, features guest vocals by Alan Jackson. Another album cut, Waiting on a Woman, would be released as a single and music video three years later with guest vocalist Andy Griffith for Paisley's 2008 album, Play. Turning 10 years old this month is third season American Idol winner Fantasia's third album, Back to Me. Although it was her first album to not achieve gold or platinum certification, it was her highest charting album to that point on both the Billboard R&B Albums chart, where it reached number one, and the Billboard 200, where it peaked at number two. Lead-off single, Bittersweet, was a top ten hit on the Billboard R&B singles chart and topped the Billboard adult R&B chart. Follow-up single, I'm Doin' Me, went top 20 on the R&B singles chart, and Collard Greens and Cornbread just missed the top 40 on the same chart. Back to Me received a Grammy nomination for Best R&B Album. The album title was suggested to her by Steve Harvey when Fantasia was a guest on his morning radio show. Also released in August of 2010 was Katy Perry's sophomore album Teenage Dream. It may have only spent one week at its peak position of number one on the Billboard 200, but it became only the 25th album in history to spend more than 200 weeks on that chart, ultimately remaining on the Billboard 200 for four and a half years. It was a number one album in seven other countries, including the UK, Canada, and Australia. It enjoys quadruple platinum status in those three countries and triple platinum certification in the US. Of the album's six singles, California Girls featuring Snoop Dogg, the title track, Firework, E.T. featuring Kanye West and Last Friday Night all hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100. 
all of them except the title track topped the Canadian singles chart, and all of them except Last Friday Night went number one in New Zealand. The one that got away was the one that got away from being number one in any country. Teenage Dream received a Grammy Award nominations for Album of the Year and Best Pop Album, as well as Juno and Brit Award nominations for International Album of the Year. Five years ago this month, Dr. Dre released his third album, Compton. His first solo album in 15 years, it topped the album's charts in 10 countries, including the UK, Australia, Canada, the Netherlands, and France, and was a top 10 album in six more countries. It was his third number one solo album on the Billboard Hip Hop Albums chart, and peaked at number two on the Billboard 200, and is certified gold in the US, the UK, France, and Australia. The album boasts appearances by Kendrick Lamar, Anderson Pock, Jill Scott, Snoop Dogg, Eminem, and Ice Cube. Samples used on the album include compositions from an Italian prog rock band, as well as Thai and Turkish artists. August of 2015 also saw the release of Beauty Behind the Madness, the weekend sophomore album. It spent three consecutive weeks at number one on the Billboard 200, and remained in the top ten of the chart for 21 consecutive weeks. It was also a number one album in Sweden, Norway, the UK, Australia, and the weekend's native Canada. It was a top ten album in 12 more countries. Singles The Hills and Can't Feel My Face topped the singles charts in Canada and the US and were top five hits in Australia and the UK, with Can't Feel My Face also reaching number one in Denmark and New Zealand. Subsequent single In the Night reached number 12 on both the Canadian and US charts. The album made year-end lists of numerous publications including Rolling Stone, The New York Times, and Pitchfork, and scored a Grammy nomination for Album of the Year and a Grammy win for Best Urban Contemporary Album. The weekend took home Juno Awards for Album of the Year and R&B Recording of the Year. Okay, now on we go to the Spotlight Albums portion of this month's Backtracks video. I've got two Spotlight Albums for you again this month, as I try to do every month. I've missed out a couple of times this year, but uh, what can you do, right? Uh, the difference, though, between this month and last month, though, is that I think both of the artists this month are higher profile than the two artists I featured last month. To be brutally honest, I cannot remember who those artists were or what the albums were uh, for my last month's backtracks. Sorry about that. That's the way my memory's been lately. But uh, yes, I, I try to bring reasonably high-profile albums. So yeah, last month I kind of uh, dropped the ball on that one, but I think we're doing pretty good. Uh, the second one I'm going to show you is a much higher-profile artist. Everybody's heard at least one album by that artist. But uh, I thought I would do the lesser, less familiar, second-tier uh, popularity rock band only because they are not uh, actively recording albums right now. Uh, I think they might still be together and be touring. Well, not right now, obviously, but you know. Uh, but anyway, yes, uh, without further ado, the first Spotlight album for this month is by the Quicksilver Messenger Service. You've probably at least heard of them. Uh, I had heard of them, but had never, like most Spotlight album artists I, I try to do in my videos, I had never heard a full album by QMS before. So this is my introduction to them. This is their fourth album, Just For Love. It was released in August 1970, so it is 50 years old this month. Happy birthday. And uh, it peaked at number 27 on the Billboard 200, so it's a, it was a moderately successful album, I guess. But yeah, this album has, and I believe QMS is was uh, typically was more of a psychedelic rock band. But this album has a rather mellow, bluesy kind of a feel to it. So they've it's, they've kind of mellow out on this album. Uh, but but again, I this is the first album of heard theirs that I've heard, so I cannot compare it to their, their other albums. But uh, yeah, the the mellow, bluesy feel to it, as I said, is very prominent on the opening track, Wolf Run Part One. And that's an interesting thing about this album is, uh, I don't know if you can see the track listing, if I can get it up close enough, but uh, the album's track list is bookended by two nesting bookend tracks, I guess you'd say. Um, the first track on the album is Wolf Run Part 1, track 2 is Just For Love Part 1, and the album closes with Just For Love Part 2 and then Wolf Run Part 2. So they're kind of, you know, bookended tracks but nested. So an interesting concept for the album. It's just a great intro track, kind of an... Uh, uh, to, to kind of get you into the groove of the album, very low-key, laid-back. Wolf Run Part 1 is just excellent in that way. And uh, there's a, a great jam band kind of song on here, and I am not a jam band person, but this one was pretty darn cool. It's called Cobra, and yeah, I, I'm, I just never thought I would care for a jam band type of sound, but this is a big exception. And, and I don't know, my tastes are evolving over the years, as, as I've already noticed, so maybe I would like jam band stuff uh, of, from other artists, I don't know. But uh, yeah, that track, Cobra, is definitely runs in, in that kind of a style. So that was a, a, a great song. And uh, Fresh Air was their biggest hit 
off this album. It came in at number 49, so again, a fairly modest hit. But uh, it is a standout on this album in terms of, in, in the fact that it's got much more of a conventional or ordinary rock sound. So, which, you know, if those of you who like the more conventional stuff and not the, you know, meandering jam band kind of stuff might like that song in particular, uh, I, I'm not ashamed to admit that I am a bit more lean toward the ordinary stuff, you know, the, the conventional sound. But, uh, you know, even if you don't like it, that's kind of an interesting um, way to break up the album. It just kind of, you know, makes the album more interesting as it kind of has that track in there that to, you know, as, as a differentiation between the rest of the stuff. That's what I'm trying to say here. And um, there are a couple of really long tracks in here uh, that last seven minutes or longer. Gone Again is uh, uh, clocks in at more than seven minutes, and The Hat is ten and a half minutes long. And those are just great. Neither of those ever wear out their welcome. It's kind of a funny thing. Uh, I, I don't care for, at least I haven't in the past cared for, jam band kind of stuff. But songs that are overly long like that, I don't mind. And uh, these two I certainly don't mind. They, they just, as I said, they never seem to wear out their welcome. But yeah, this is just a great album. and. I'm going to need to listen to it once or twice more to see if it really compels me to check out QMS's discography in any more depth. But uh, yeah, this was a great first taste of Quicksilver Messenger Service, their album Just For Love. It's really, really good. And as for the second Spotlight album today, I'm sure I've piqued your curiosity. I mentioned a few minutes ago that it's a high-profile artist and a reasonably high-profile album. Uh, so let's just get it out of the way here without delaying it any longer. It is Freaky Styly, the sophomore album by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Now, unlike most Spotlight album artists, I have, of course, listened to several albums by the Chili Peppers. I've got their three albums that uh, they did with Rick Rubin back in the 90s. Those are probably the albums that they're most famous for. But uh, yeah, this was their sophomore album produced by George Clinton, and that is the uh, probably the biggest selling point. Uh, well, also that it was a, an anniversary album. It actually turns 35 years old in August, incidentally, released in August of 1985. Uh, but yeah, that was kind of the big selling point was uh, that it was produced by George Clinton, and as a result it has that huge funky sound, that, that funkadelic type of sound, all throughout the album. And uh, plenty of funk and bass, and uh, although uh, the one thing that's missing off this album is Flea's signature slap bass style. That hasn't quite shown up yet. It, it shows up a little bit in a couple of the tracks, but uh, it's definitely not at the stage that you hear it in, uh, you know, by the era of the uh, uh, Rick Rubin albums, obviously. Uh, there are two covers on this album, Hollywood Africa, which was originally by the pioneering funk band The Meters, as well as If You Want Me To Stay, which was by Sly and the Family Stone. Both of those are very, very well done covers, and I'm not sure, uh, and this is something I probably should have looked up, I don't know how often the Chili Peppers did covers on their albums. I don't know if this was the last time they ever did covers or, or what, but uh, cool takes on the, those two classic funk songs. Now, one of the more memorable songs on this album for me was The Brothers Cup. Uh, that one is on side two, and I honestly don't know what to say about it that makes it more memorable to me, but it's just one of them that just stood out uh, sonically for me. And uh, also, the closing track is Yertle the Turtle, which is, it takes its lyrics from the Dr. Seuss poem of the same name, so it's based on the Dr. Seuss poem. But ironically, even though it's based on a kid's poem, it's probably closest to the funk style that they would go on to be famous for in their Rick Rubin albums. That's one of the tracks that's got the very beginnings of Flea's slap bass style. So it's kind of an interesting that, uh, you know, a Dr. Seuss uh, cover, so to speak, would be uh, one of the funkier tracks on the album. So it's just great. And uh, yeah, so this was a fun album, kind of a, you know, a whimsical album in a couple places. And I'm sure to a degree, at some point, all of their albums are probably whimsical in some way. But yeah, this is it's, it's really good. And uh, the album actually never charted on the Billboard 200, and neither did either of its singles, and I can kind of see why. Uh, not that it's not a good album or uh, worth a listen. It's definitely worth a listen. It's just, you know, it was a little or ordinary, at least in uh, in comparison to their Rick Rubin albums and, and their other later work. Uh, but I had been looking for an excuse to... Uh, delve into something other than the Rick Rubin albums. This is the first non-Rick Rubin album uh, by the Chili Peppers that I've ever listened to, and it was a very interesting listen. Um, I was thinking the other day, would I have, if I had listened to this album at the time, would I have sensed promise in the Chili Peppers, and would I have gone on to listen to their other stuff? I don't know. Um, well, just because my music tastes back then, when I was, uh, you know, 85, I was 14 at the time, were much different, I probably wouldn't have, but, you know, you never know if it's if my life had gone down a different path and somebody else had maybe sampled, uh, you know, compelled me to listen to him. 
Maybe I would be the world's biggest Chili Peppers fan by now, but uh, yeah, this is, honestly, it's not the best Chili Peppers album, but it's still very much worth a listen, and, and yeah, it's a worthy addition to my Backtracks Spotlight Albums catalog. And that will do it for Backtracks for the month of August 2020. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, hit that like button and share it with your friends. And give me your thoughts, questions, suggestions, or constructive criticisms in the comments section below. Also, scroll down to the description for the link to my Twitter and Instagram feeds, and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.